Hello, and uh, welcome to the first class of Compiler Construction uh, 406. Um, like uh, my other classes, um, I'll mainly be working down here um, in with my writing tablet, talking about um, you know the course compilers, and you can check out the. Uh, subreddit and discord for discussion and you can look at the course site for a description of the syllabus schedule project that kind of thing the main goal of this class is for you to learn about how to make a compiler by making a compiler um, for a really simple programming language that you know is a little more than basic math but it grows gradually across the course um, and eventually gets to the point where it's basically as complicated as, um, you know, language like JavaScript. It's very similar um, to the language that we write the virtual machine for in my Organization of Programming Languages class. Um, but in that class, uh, we can actually go much faster and further because we're, uh, you know, just writing a virtual machine. But it's harder to write uh, a compiler. So uh, we tend to have to go slower, and we end up not getting to the same places, but we kind of do things in a different order. Um, the class is sort of broadly based on um, a book by Jeremy Seek. It's called Essentials of Compilation. And, uh, you know, I highly recommend uh, reading the book. Um, I kind of imagine that you'll be able to do the entire class without looking at the book, um, just, you know, watching the videos and working on the project yourself. But, you know, the book is a good resource. The one caveat with that um, is that the book, by the way, I'm, yeah, I kind of feel like I should write something down. Uh, it's called Essentials of Compilation. Compilation by Jeremy Seek. Um, the one thing about the book is that the book kind of assumes that you're going to use um, some software that he wrote, well, you know, him and his team wrote for making the compiler yourself, um, and that you're going to write in the Rocket programming language. Um, I do not recommend doing that. Um, even if you are already a, you know, a great Rocket programmer, um, I don't recommend doing that because... I think that you're going to learn more if you implement it all yourself. And if you don't know anything about Racket, uh, I think that um, getting into Racket and using uh, this and trying to figure out how to even use the software that um, you know that he made, uh, you know, it's just not worth the effort um, when you you could just as well, uh, you know, learn everything using whatever language you're already familiar with. So people have done this project extremely successfully using programming languages like Java, JavaScript, Python, Go, Haskell. People have used Racket. Um, someone wrote a really good C++ version. Someone wrote a version in Rust. So, you know, you can really use pretty much any language you want. And I highly recommend, you know, choosing something yourself. I would not recommend trying to use this class as an opportunity to learn a new programming language. Um, it's a pretty intense project. Uh, and so, yeah, it's kind of difficult to do. All right, with that kind of sort of backgroundy stuff out of the way, I just want to jump right in and start talking about stuff. Um, so the goal of this class is to write a compiler. And so what is a compiler? At a very sort of basic level, a compiler is actually a really simple function, right? It's a function that goes from some data type A to another data type B, where A is the type of programs of language X and B is the type of programs of language Y. So for example, you know, if I think about a compiler like GCC, GCC takes programs written in the C programming language and returns programs written in, let's say, x86. Of course, you may know that behind the scenes what really goes on when you use GCC is is that it you know produces this intermediate representation and it can turn that intermediate representation into many different things. So another example like this might be Clang. So Clang 
is a compiler that takes a C program, and what it does is it produces an LLVM program, and then LLVM is a program that takes an LLVM program and can produce um, an x86 version, it can produce um, you know, an ARM version, it has a whole bunch of different backends. So anyways, so at a very basic level, compiler is just this, you know, kind of basic function that converts one data type to another. And there's nothing really special about the fact that it is um, taking a, a high-level programming language like C or Java or something like that into a low-level thing like, you know, x86 assembly code. Um, it's still structured like a normal program. The thing that just makes uh, the compiler different uh, is that, you know, it's kind of a complicated program uh, in that, uh, you know, converting something like, I don't know, a text document into a picture, you know, like that's a very simple, that's a, that's a simple function to describe its type, but um, it may be more straightforward than what a compiler does. Because kind of the main thing that a compiler needs to do is it needs to, well, let's think about it, right? I mean, if we think about GCC, for instance, if we're going to convert a C program into an x86 program. You know, imagine that, imagine what my C program is, is, say, an image editor. Well, I can't turn it into just any x86 program. I should turn it into an x86 program that does the same thing as the C program. So that additional caveat, a program that does the same thing, that's kind of a, an important question. So what does that even mean for it to be right, for to have, have it behave the same? So I just got a new one of these tablets. So how do I switch pages? There used to be a button. Oh, this is dumb. I'm going to pause for a second. All right. Very easy. You just swipe to the left and it does it. Oh, you know what? I'm going to make a little note right here that this is page, this is page 1-1. One -one. And then on this page, I'm going to write this is page 1-2. One -one so you'll be able to sort of uh, look at the screen and know where in uh, the PDFs that are posted uh, where the thing that I'm talking about is. Okay, so when is a compiler, when is a compiler uh, correct? This is a question that we will have about compilers. When are they correct? Well, the main idea is to try to capture what it means to say a program with the same meaning or that does the same thing. So typically what we do is we say that imagine that there is another function. Let me just write down, by the way, compile. So compile takes an A program and returns a B program. And then there's a, we can imagine another function that's called interp. I'm going to write interp of A here. And so it's going to take an A program and it's going to return an answer. Now, an answer might be a number. It might be like some specification of like a user interaction, that kind of thing. Then we can have another function that we'll call interp b, and this takes a b program and returns an answer. And so now a compiler is correct if there's if we have the following uh, graph. If we can start with an a program, compile it into a b program, then take that b program and interpret with b, and we'll get back little b, that's the b answer. And we can take the, we can also take the original program and interpret with the a interpreter and get a little a, and that a and b are the same. These, that the answers between them are the same. 
we can write this as a theorem where we would say something like for all um, programs inside of A, if you interp with the A interpreter P, you get the same thing as if you interp with the B interpreter, the compilation of P. And so this right here constitutes um, the pr a compiler being correct. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, these interpreters in any sort of theoretical way. Um, that's kind of the subject of the organization of program languages class. And if you were to, um, you know, study program language theory in more detail, there's all sorts of different techniques and ideas for how to define these interpreters. And this graph right here is, you know, a little bit of a, um, what's the right way to say this? Um, it's a little bit uh, vague, um, especially with regard to what exactly these answers are. And in particular, like, you know, answers for an A program might sort of be different than answers for a B program. Like, here's an example of what I mean by that. So like you can imagine a Java program. When you run it, the answer to that Java program is like an object. But when you take an x86 program and run that, the answer is basically like the state of memory. And so how do you, know, how do you say that, like, this object is the same thing as that state of memory? It doesn't really make sense. So what you really need to do is you really need to say that there has to be some function that like maps between these that can say like, well, this object, you could like view it as this memory or this memory, you could view it as that object and then they would be the same. So, you know, it's a little bit vague, but this is kind of the idea that a compiler is right if the result of compilation produces the same answer as the input. And what we're going to do in this class is we're going to literally make our compiler by doing this. And what I, what I, what I mean by that is, is that we're going to structure our compiler by saying, here's our input language, and then we're going to write a really simple interpreter for it. Then we're going to say, here's our output language, and we're going to write a really simple interpreter for that. And what you're going to do is you're literally going to test and check that the answers are always the same. And one of the things that I'm going to have you do uh, in your project is I'm going to have you write something that randomly generates A programs. And by randomly generating A programs, you can just run them and get their answer. Then you can compile them and get a B program and then run it and get its answer. And now you'll basically have like an infinite set of test cases um, for you to try your program on. Okay, so we've sort of established, you know, uh, I want to go the other direction. We've established what a compiler is. It takes something, a program written in one language and turns it into a program written in another language. We've talked about how we know that it's right if it returns the same answer. There's kind of another thing that matters, which is, you know, when is a compiler good? When is a compiler good? Now, obviously, good is a, a very, um, you know, a very broad term, you know what I mean? Uh, so how do we, how do, how do we say if it's, if it, you know, what, what do we, what do we even mean by good? I'm not going to like spend too much time, you know, being philosophical on you. Um, but I'll sort of talk about, um, sort of two ways of thinking about it. So one way is to say that it's good if, um, there's a big gap there's a big gap between A and B, between A and B. So what do I mean by a big gap? So, you know, you're a programmer, right? So if you've tried to write assembly programs before, one of the experiences that I hope that you've had is that it's really frustrating to write an assembly program because you don't have all of the conveniences of modern programming languages like I mean, we don't even have the conveniences of old programming languages. Like, there are no variables. There's no stack to make function calls with, kind of. You know, there's no, there's not really functions. There are just labeled blocks. So writing a program by hand in assembly is really frustrating. There's all these things that you need to do that are taken care of for you automatically by compilers. And so 
In that sense, these compilers are good because there's a very large gap, gap between C and x86 assembly, let's say. But now, even other kinds of compilers can have these large gaps, even if they're not going directly to assembly. So, for example, um, you know, if you've programmed in Python or JavaScript before, one of the things that you may experience is that, oh, it's really great to not have to worry about um, uh, what memory you're going to use and like allocating things and removing them later. It's very frustrating to do that. Well, what you could imagine doing is taking, making a compiler that takes a Python program and turns it into a C program that did manage memory. And so in that sense, there's a large gap between Python and C with respect to the way that memory works. And so that would be an example of the language A being Python and the language B being C that has this big gap. Sometimes, um, you know, people will even take very high level languages. Uh, and, you know, I'm not, I don't want to like formally define what it means to be high level. I kind of don't even really like that word, but people use it. So I think you'll know what I'm talking about. So, for example, you know, in the JavaScript community, there's quite a few extensions to JavaScript where they take a program that looks kind of vaguely like JavaScript and then they compile it to a simpler version of JavaScript. So a good example of this is like TypeScript. So TypeScript is a programming language that is like almost identical to JavaScript, but it has um, some basically checks to help you make sure that your program is correct. And it compiles to JavaScript. And so in that sense, you know, the gap, in, in some sense you might say it's really small because the behavior of TypeScript is the same as the behavior of JavaScript, but on the other hand, maybe the gap is quite large because what TypeScript does is it enforces rules that are totally unenforced by JavaScript. So a compiler's job basically is to like take one of these gaps and remove it from the from the from the perspective of what compile of, of what users need. And you know why why is this really relevant? I mean the thing is that like think about your x86 program. Like your x86 program, that's what you want to run because you have sitting in front of you an interpreter for x86. You know, it's your CPU or you know if you have one of these fancy new Macs, you have a you have sitting in front of you an interpreter for you know ARM64. So you have an interpreter for the B language, and you really want to run programs, but you don't want to write programs in it. You want to write A programs and run A programs. So the the gap is the the gap between what you have and what you need. Um, yeah. So there's another way of thinking about what makes a compiler good, which is like you could compare like two compilers to each other. So you know two different two different um, compilers. So what I mean by that is that imagine we have C1 that goes from A to B, and we have C2 that goes from A to B. How can we compare these? Well, basically what we could do is we could imagine that there's some measure, some measure of Bs. So what it does is it takes, um, you know, it takes, uh, a B program and like turns it into like a natural number that says what its goodness is. And what we might say is, is that, you know, C1 is better than C2 if and only if when you take a program that like measures of programs compiled by C1 are better than measures of programs compiled by C2. So for example, this would be a way to try to characterize like what it means for a compiler to have like a good optimizer or like a better optimizer than another. What you might imagine is, is that this M thing, what it's measuring is like how fast your program is. Or maybe it's measuring like how small your program is because you're trying to like compile it to an embedded CPU or something like. Or maybe you're interested in like how parallel it is because... So basically there are many different ways that you can think of measuring the quality of a program. And you can think of a way to think about a compiler being good as having a good one of those measures. Because it's certainly the case that there are many compilers that go from A to B and remove gaps that like don't do a very good job at it. Like just give me, let me give you like a totally trivial example. So you could have a compiler that goes from math problems to instructions to humans to solve the math problem. So for example, 
you know, you could say like, okay, we want to add 1099 to 22. And so one way to do that would be to say like, step one, turn it into a binary number. Step two, turn the other one into a binary number. Then run this algorithm for adding them. And that would be, that would be um, you know, potentially an efficient um, algorithm. Turning, a, turning something in digits to binary numbers is going to be uh, linear in the length of the digits. Then turning the other one is going to be linear in the length of the digits. And then adding them is going to be linear in the number of bits. So it's going to be like a 3N algorithm. Okay. Another way to do it would be something like, okay, well, take the first number and hold up that number of fingers. And if you don't have that many fingers, enlist some friends to hold up that number of fingers. Then uh, go find, take, then look at the second number and then start putting up more fingers, counting down from that number to zero. And then afterwards, count up all the fingers that you have. This algorithm is not linear in the number of in the number of digits, it's linear in the size of the problem. Now, you know, the first program that converts to binary and does stuff, or the first compiler, it's harder to run that program because you need to, uh, you know, you need to know what it means to convert things into binary. And the program that just, you know, you hold up fingers, like my little kids downstairs, they could do that. Um, but you need more people. So anyways, my point is, is that there's kind of like trade-offs uh, in how you compile things. And there's like ways of compiling things in like a dumb way that works, that removes the gap. This is the, uh, you know, counting with fingers way of adding. Uh, but you don't really want to do them. Okay, so anyways, we can think about a compiler being good as having like a good optimizer. So one of the things that I would like to do as kind of a theme in this class is every time we talk about compiling, I want to talk about the way in which we're removing a gap and the way in which we're trying to improve performance relative to some dumb way of doing it. And I think those are like the two kind of fundamental ways to, to think about what compilers are doing, and I think that'll be helpful. Okay, so now that we kind of have these basics out of the way, let's talk about like how you really do it. Like how do you actually write one of these compilers? And generally kind of what I'm gonna do is we're going to say that um, that we're going to try to like go almost from like the bottom up and kind of from the top down. And what, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that what I want to do is I want to describe a whole bunch of the little different components of what goes into a compiler. And then we're going to stitch those together and get a really simple compiler. And then what we'll do is we'll then say, all right, now let's make our language a little bit more complicated. And by making it a little bit more complicated, we're gonna have to go and modify all of those little components into new versions. So what I mean by that is we're gonna say like, okay, let's build these little pieces, okay? And then we're gonna stitch them together, okay? And then once we stitch them together, now we're gonna have a compiler. And then what we're gonna do, and this is the our compiler for, you know, A to B. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to say, but I really want a compiler from A prime. Well, what I'll do is I'll now say, okay, well, I'll change this thing into this slightly different version. I'll change that thing into this version. I'll change this one um, into this version. This one turns out it can be the same. And then I've got to add this totally new piece right here. And now I'll stitch them together in this new way. And now once I stitch them together in this new way, now I've got my compiler for a prime. And that's kind of the structure of this class. So we're going to go back and forth between defining what the overall, what the individual little pieces are, then connecting them together, and then we'll modify the language to make it more complicated. And then when we modify the language to make it more complicated, we'll have to go adjust all the pieces and then move on from there. Okay, now what are the like the different components of even doing this? So the fundamental thing that we kind of are going to start with is that we have to like define the language that we're even going to compile. Now, since you've already taken organization programmages, it should be kind of, you know, uh, sensible what I'm about to write. So we're going to say that we're going to call our language that we're compiling, we're going to call it R0. And uh, it, we're going to say that a program, P, is equal to... Um, 
the word program, and then an E. And then what is an E? Well, an E is either going to be a number, or it's going to be a unary negation, or it is going to be an addition of two E's, or it is going to be a call to the read function. Okay, so this is a very, very simple language. Again, recall back to your, um, you know, organizational programming language class. This is kind of like the, um, you know, the iSwim language or, you know, the, the very basic language that, that we looked at there, except this one is like way simpler because we only have numbers. So like one, two, three, four, five. We have a single function that uh, operates on unary things the negate function, and we have a single function for adding. But in other ways, it's a little bit more complicated because we have this read thing. Okay, now what's this read thing? So what the read thing does is it reads input from the user. The whole point of read is to make it so that our programs uh, cannot always be reduced to a value without actually running them. Because if we didn't have read, then now our programs, like you could make an optimizer for them that just figured out what the answer was but we're not going to be able to do that. Okay, so that is our, um, that is our basic language. Now, like, what does this like really look like in your compiler? Because so you're going to take this, you know, this definition of this is what my language is. And um, by the way, I'm going to say that there's also this like little info field here for your programs, which will just you know accrue information that you may find useful. Okay, so like, what do these things really look like? So let's imagine an example program. So here's a program that we might write. We might write that our program is a program, and we'll say, actually, you know what? Scratch that. Uh, ooh, can I erase with this? No. Maybe I hold this down. I thought that there was some way with this new one to erase stuff, but I guess not. I literally have never used this before today. Oh, nope, that's not what I want. Erase selection. There we go. All right. Okay. So imagine we have this, the following C program. So we're going to write a program in C. We're going to write return the negation of 17 plus calling the read function plus 42. Okay, so we want that program, that C program, and we're going to write it in our programming language. So the way that we would write this program is we would write program, and then we would have our info, which is just nothing. So I'm just going to like put a blank there. And then we're going to say that there's a negation. Okay, so this whole thing is negated. And then, actually, you know what, did I, did I say negative 17 or did I negate the whole thing? Let's say that I uh, just negated 17. So in that case, I'm going to have a plus with negative 17. Then I'm going to have another plus that has a call to read. And then we're going to have our 42. So we're going to close that parenthesis, close that parenthesis, close that parenthesis. Now this thing that we've just written down here is called an abstract syntax tree. If you were to write it in your programming language, like the, if you were to look at the data structure, you would have a pointer to the program object and that would have a pointer to the info blob right there. And then it would have a pointer to a plus. And the plus would have a pointer to a minus, which would have a pointer to a 17. The plus would also have a pointer to another plus, which would have a pointer to a read, which would have a pointer to a 42. So this object in memory, this tree, is what we mean when we write this thing right here. In this class, we are not going to talk about parsing programming uh, we're not going to talk about parsing ex programs into these abstract syntax trees. So we're not going to write a function that takes this and returns that. Uh, I'm going to leave that for you to implement that if you want. Um, what I recommend that you do is you either allow programs to be written in this format right here because it's really easy to parse. This is called an S expression. An S expression. So it's really easy to parse these. And uh, you're doing this class not to make a program language to, you know, compete with JavaScript. You're doing it to learn about compilers. So you don't want to spend your time making the syntax. 
So you can just take these S expressions and write them like that. Or what you could do is you could directly write these terms in your programming language. And what I mean by that, by directly write them, I mean that you could like write like new program and then, you know, pass in, let's say, like, true for the, for the information, and then write, like, new add. And then inside here, write, like, new negate, and then have new number 17, and then that closes the negate, and then you'd say new add, and then you would say new read, and then new number 42, close the add, close the other add, close the program, and then bam, now we've written it. Now you could write your programs like that, or what you could do is you could like, you know, write something that's kind of like this uh, in your language, but like using, like suppose that we were going to write it in like JavaScript, I, I would write the following, I would say like, I would just make an array that has program at the front of it. And then I would have, like the next element would be like true, let's say. And then there would be another array that would have a plus, and then another array that would have a minus, and then there'd be my 17. And then there'd be another array with a plus, and then I would have uh, an array with read in it, and then I'd have my 42, and then I'd close that array, close that array, close that array. And so essentially what we'd be doing is we could like write this syntax right here, but using the arrays of our language. Now this is something that is really nice to do in like Python or JavaScript or something like that. It's a kind of a pain to do something like that in like Java or C++ or whatever, but you can do it. There's, there's ways of doing things like this. Okay. So these guys right here are called abstract syntax trees. They abstract away the they um, they abstract away the direct syntax of our language into the format. Okay. So this right here R zero is our language where we have um, subtraction, addition, read, and program. Those are the different things that we have. And Here's an example program. Now, what is the what what's the meaning of this program? Well, it depends on what happens when you run read. Like, I could run this program and I could give it zero, in which case the answer would be, you know, like 42 minus 17, which is like 20, 25? I guess it's 25. Um, or I could give, you know, three, and then the answer would be 62, you know what I mean? So the thing is, is that we don't know what the what the meaning of this program is until after we run it. So in this case, you know, going back to that diagram, the answers to this program are not like numbers, they're like functions that take input. Okay, so how could we like write, how could we like uh, um, really do this? Okay, actually let me sort of break for a moment and just say that um, everything that I talk about is going to correspond like pretty much one-to-one -one with the tasks of the project list. So like right here, we have, told, uh, you know, we've talked about what R0 is. And then over here, we've talked about how you could um, represent this as, you know, data structures in your language. So task number one is for you to define data types to represent R0 programs in your language. And then like task two is to make a pretty printer for those so that you can like see them back out. And then the next thing to do is to like go off and write a whole bunch of programs. Now the next thing that we want to do is we want to be able to actually interpret them. Because remember, we're going to literally do that diagram where we're going to interpret our program first, compile it, and then interpret what comes out to make sure we have the right answer. So how do we write an interpreter for this? So we're going to say that to interpret, it's going to take an R0 program and it'll produce a number. I'll just write things here. So for instance, if we call interp and we give it a number n, then we should get back that number n. And if we interpret a negation of an expression, then what we're going to do is we're going to do negative 1 times calling interp on that expression. And if we call interp on an addition of a left and a right, 
then we're going to interp the left and then add it to interping the right. Then finally, if we call interp on read, then what are we going to do? So there's two different ways that we could do this. Way number one, I'm going to write here one, is that you could like ask the user. And when I say ask the user, what I mean is that you could do like scanf or whatever it is in your program language to like actually ask the user to do something. My advice is that this is kind of a pain to do because it's hard to test your programs because you'll have to constantly like type stuff in and like make sure you're doing the same one. So another way that you could do it is you could actually make it so that your interpreter takes an additional argument, which is called like the read answers. So it has like a whole list of all the read answers or something like that, and then go grab one of them. Now, another way that you can do it, and this is actually what I do, what I do is I do this thing number one, where I go ask the user, but what I did is I made it so that, um, well, I use a programming language where my scanf function can basically like change from the outside to say, don't go look at the actual standard input. Instead, go look in this other place. And when I test it, I like send in um, like a particular values. Okay, it's kind of like a way of like faking input. Because of course, you don't really care about this interpreter for like running these programs. You care about it for testing your, your compiler. Okay, so what we have right now is we have our basic programming language, R0. We have um, our ASTs that we made, and now we have our interpreter. And what do we want to do after that? Our interpreter is, a, is like the first example of a meta program, a program that consumes other programs. What we want to do next is we want to think about other kinds of meta programs that are going to be useful for us. No, they're going to be helpful for making programs, uh, sorry, for making our compiler, but they're also going to be useful because they're going to help us, um, they're going to help us get used to writing programs that manipulate other programs, which is of course what our compiler is going to do. So for practice, let's write a, let's write a few other meta programs. So let's write the meta program that's going to be called um, 2 to the n, and it's going to take an integer, and it's going to return an R0 program. And here is the specification of it. When we call interpret of 2n on m, we should get back the answer 2 to the m. So remember, 2 to the n is a program written in whatever language you want that takes a number and returns an R0 program. Because remember, compilers, they take programs and produce other programs. So interp, what it does is it takes a program and produces a number. What you're going to do is you're going to take a number and produce a program. So we had practice making a program that consumes an R0 program. Now we're going to practice having, making a program that produces a program. Okay, so how do we write this function? Well, it's quite easy, actually. So 2 to the n of 0 is just equal to the number 1. Now again, it's not the number one, it's the data structure that encodes a number one. Similarly, if we write 2 to the n and we give it 1 plus m, then what we should get is we should get an addition node of 2 to the m and 2 to the m. Now again, what we really mean is we really mean you're going to call like new add, okay? And you're going to give it x and x, where x is equal to 2 to the m, okay? Now, what's going to come out of this is that if we were to give 2 to the n 2, we would get an addition node, where on the left-hand side would be an addition node, where on the left-hand side would be a 1, and then on the right-hand side would be the same one, and on the right-hand side of this would be the same addition node. So this right here is the data structure that would come out of running this 2 to the n function. Okay, so 2 to the n is a, is a very basic program that takes a number and produces another R0 program. Let's look at another example. 
let's write a program that's going to be called rand p for random program. What it's going to do is it's going to take a number and it's going to produce an r0 program, but we don't know what the result of this program is going to be. All we know is, is that um, its depth of the program, how, how uh, deep the abstract syntax tree is, is going to be this number n. So for example, when we write rand p, 0, what we're going to do here is we're going to flip a coin, and on heads, what we'll do is we'll return read. And on tails, what we'll do is we'll pick a random number between some range like 0 to 1024 or something like that. So we'll just pick a random number. So when you call ran 0 and 0, you either get back a read or a number, because those are programs that have uh, you know, depth 0. But if you call rand p and you give it 1 plus n, then what we're going to do is we're going to flip a coin. Okay, and on heads, we're going to get the negation of rand p n. And on tails, what we're going to do is we're going to get the addition of one call to rand p n and another call to rand p n. Okay? So for example, I could call rand p on 2, and I might get the following behavior. So I might flip a coin. Oh, you know what? It would be cool if I actually like, had a coin, wouldn't it? Hmm. Okay, so I don't have a coin, but I have this little doily thing <coughs> that my daughter made. So we're going to call the back part. Where is it? The back part right here. This is going to be the back. That's going to be tails. And this is going to be the head. You can tell because it's kind of like fluffier here. Oh, so we're going to throw it in the air. Oh, and it was heads. Looks like it doesn't really spin very well. So we're going to get a negation of rand p1. Okay, so we're going to do it again. Oh, and it got... It, yeah, this didn't really work very well. Hmm. Okay, so what do we got next? Um, what else do I have just sitting around here? Nothing really good. Hmm. Okay, I've got uh, this Red Bull car. No, I don't really want to throw that up in the air. Um, okay, well, let's just say that it comes up, the next one comes up tails. So then we'll get a minus of a plus of ran p0 and another ran p0. And let's say that uh, the next time um, this one becomes a read and then that one becomes a 12. So we get minus plus read of 12. Okay, so this is an example of something that would come out of ran p2. Now, we could take this program that we just generated, and we could run it through an interpreter, and we could get back an answer, and we could just do this a ton. And now, what we would have done is we would have produced a way of generating, you know, a random set of programs and verifying, and, and, and checking them, checking what their behavior is. Now, as I mentioned... It's kind of, an, these reads complicate, are going to complicate everything about our compiler. It's what's going to make our compiler difficult in the beginning. So here's some advice. When you randomly generate a program, write another program that can look through your program and figure out how many times there's a rand in it. And, if, and then you can just count them and then like generate that many random numbers and feed them in to your test interpreter function. So you can say, you know, the first read is going to be 12, and the second read is going to be 18 or whatever. And then that way you'll be able to test your interpreter um, on these random values, or th these random programs. Okay, what is the last thing that we're going to do today? So the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about a certain category of compiler. And this is a category of compiler where the input language and the output language are the same, and that is an optimizer. So an optimizer is going to take an R0 program, actually really an optimizer takes an A program and returns an A program, and we're going to make an optimizer that's going to take our R0 programs and return new R0 programs. So the goal of an optimizer is to simplify our program. Okay. 
And what we want to do is um, we want to improve its performance. Now, like these are really simple programs, right? They only have addition, subtraction, and read. So the kind of the goal is that what we want to do is we want to make it so that as much as possible is done um, is done uh, statically at compile time than we can. So let's write down the rules for opt. So if you call opt and you give it a number, it's just going to return that number because there's no way to make that faster. If we call opt on read, then we're just going to get back read again because again, there's no way to do it better. All right, but now what about something like when you call opt on negation of e? Hmm, how could we do how could we do this well? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to consider all the different cases of calling opt on e. Now, what do I mean by that? That means that we're going to take the inner expression and we're going to call opt on it. And we're going to look at what comes out. So imagine that the thing that came out was a concrete number, n. Well, in that case, we can return the number, the number, which is the actual negation of n. So you call optimize, and it goes and it figures out that the, that the value of this program is 20. Well, if it's 20, then we're going to return negative 20. Okay. What if instead we got back a negation of some other program, e prime? Well, we know that the negation of negation is just e prime, so we can return e prime. So we've now improved our program by making it so that we got rid of two negations that were next to one another. Okay, is there anything else that we could do? Is there any other way to do it? I mean, any other improvements that we can make? Well, one thing that we could do is what if we got an addition where the first thing in the addition was a number n, and then after that, there was another expression e prime. Well, this is something that we could actually improve because what we could do is we could return the addition of the number, uh, the number minus one times n, okay? And then after that, we could propagate this logic. So this is the, um, this is the not opt case on e prime. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that we're calling cases on opt e. So here's what we'll do. What we'll do is we'll say that this is the not opt of opt e prime, and then not opt is equal to this thing right here. Okay, okay, let me let me just clean this up. All right, so we gotta erase something. So let's erase this over here. And then we'll say that not opt equals these cases. Okay. So when you call, when you see an opt on a minus on a, on a negation, you're gonna optimize the inner expression. Oops, that, there shouldn't be a tilde there. Sorry, there shouldn't be a, um, there shouldn't be a prime. Okay. We're going to call not opt on the optimization of E, and then we're going to look at what comes back. If we got a number, then we'll do this. If we got a negation, then we'll do that. And if we got an addition that starts with a number, then we'll flip that one and then continue. And in fact, even this, we could simplify further by saying that what we'll really do is that if we see an addition, then we'll push the optimization in one level. So we'll say not opt on the number n. And then if it's anything else, then only in this case will we actually return a negation of e prime. And the idea here is that we're going to guarantee that um, that optimus that uh, negation on numbers is done totally statically, and all the other and that we the negation operation only ever appears inside of programs when they are um, when they involve read. 
So for instance, when you if you were to call opt on like let's just write an example over here. If we were to call opt on minus read, then you would get minus read. But if you were to call opt on the addition, sorry, on the negation, you would call opt on the negation of the addition of 17 in read, then what you would get is you would get the addition of negative 17 in read. Okay, so you simplify it like that. Okay, let me just erase that example. Now, my hope is, is that if you thought about optimization before at all, you didn't think it was this simple. But really, all we're doing is we're just thinking about each individual case of what our programs could be. And then once we think about what, what our programs could be, we write down specific rules to simplify them. All right, now there's only one last case, which is what we do for addition. So let's say 110 right here, and we'll say that when we optimize an addition, of, hmm, well actually there's a bunch of different cases for addition. Like what if we're optimizing an addition and we get back a concrete number, actually hold on, sorry, let me fix this. Okay, so we're calling, we're seeing, we're calling optimize on a left and a right. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider the different cases of calling opt on L and calling opt on R. So for instance, if you call opt on each one and you reduce it to a left-hand number and a right-hand number, then what you can do is you can just return the actual number that is the addition of the two of them. So this means that if you call optimize and you give your program 10 plus 10, it will simplify that to 20. Okay, what if the left-hand side is a number and the right-hand side is an addition where there's a number at the front. And then after that, there's some other right-hand side expression. Could we simplify this? Well, we could simplify this into an addition of the number of the left number plus the right number and then the right expression. Okay, now what if it was the opposite? What if we had an addition here of a number, the left number, and a left expression, and we had an addition over here of a number and the right number, and the right, actually, hold on, That's simple. Let's, let's just focus on this example. Let me just move this over. Then over here, what we would do is something something similar. We would add the number on the left side and the right number, and then we would have the left expression. Okay. So what we're doing is we're we're noticing that if there are two concrete numbers, we can add them. If one's a number and the other has a number at the front, we can add them. And then finally, what happens if they both have a number at the front, but then an expression? And over here, there's also another number with a number at the front and a right expression. How can we simplify that? Well, we can simplify this by doing um, an addition of a number of the left number and the right number, and then an addition of the left expression and the right expression which we know that left expression and right expression, they're complicated because otherwise they would have been reduced. Okay, so we handled number, 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 add, add number, and then add, add. Um, but what if we had a number on one side and a negation? Is there any way we can improve that? Mm, not really, because the thing is, is that if that, um, if the negation was wrapped around a number, then it would have reduced it. And it was if and if it was wrapped around an add of a number, well then that first number would have been simplified as well. So that means that we would be in this situation. 
So in fact, we don't need to have any special handling for the others. In all other situations, we just say that there's a left expression and a right expression, and we return the addition of the left expression and the right expression. And so this right here is an example of a simple optimizer. What it does is it removes all computations that are not directly tied to a particular call to read. Let's finish up the day by just looking at a particular example of calling opt. So let's call opt, and I'll just sort of write a random program. We could write, um, let's just do the negation of the addition of 10 plus read of 12, and then also we'll close that um, add right there. Um, yeah, okay, this is fine. Okay, so now how do we how do we optimize this? Well, calling opt on the minus is going to opt the inside. Calling opt on the inside is going to opt that 10, which is just going to be 10. And then it's going to opt this, so really we want to think about this first. So we have a plus of a read and a 12. Well, in that case, the... Oh, sorry, there's one more thing that we want to do. Um, let me just... How can I squeeze the space? Okay, here's what we'll do. We'll take this right here, and we'll move it over to there, and then we'll add in the parentheses there. Okay, so there's one last case, which is that if we have a left expression, and on the right is a number, then we want to turn this into the addition of the number and the left expression. What this is going to do is it's going to force numbers to end up on the right. So notice that if this left expression was itself a number, then we would have taken that case. If it was a number and that was an add, we would have added them. Yeah, so if, yeah, if this was a number or if this was a number, so basically if this left expression is a number or a particular kind of add, then we'll prefer these other rules, but this one is going to make that happen. Okay, so what's going to happen here? So that means that we're going to optimize this right here into the addition of 12 in read. Okay, but now we'll run our add program, our, our optimization for add on 10 and an addition of 12 and something else. Well, that means that this thing is going to be optimized into a plus of 22 in read. And then we put a negation on that, so that means that it's going to be optimized into the addition of negative 22 and the negation of the call to read. And so this program is now simplified because we have a single constant in it and you know one negation of the call to read. Cool, right? Notice that here's kind of another thing that's a, a bit of a subtlety. We have to ensure that um, all the reads occur in the same order they would have occurred before, which is why we can't flip these right here. We can't say that the left expression and the right expression get turned into the addition of the right and the left, because we need to make sure that any additions, sorry, any reads that happen inside of left occur before the ones that occur inside of read, of re. So now, after day one, we have our definition of our language, R0, our definition of our data types, a way to generate a particular metaprogram to the n, a way to generate a random one, and a way to optimize them. So what you could do, and this is what you should do, you should do the following. You should write something like this. Mm, can I fit it there? Yeah, let's fit it right there. We should write for i in 0 to... 1,024, do the following. We're going to say, um, let p equal rand p of some number that's reasonable, like, I don't know, 6. And then write p prime equals the optimization of p. Then write the following. Check that the interp of p equals the interp of p prime. 
Now, of course, remember, there's this whole thing about we have to make sure that the reads return the same thing. So maybe what you do is you don't really run it exactly like that. You let me just move this down to there. You do something like the following. Oops. You do something like um, uh, uh, n equals count reads of p. And then you say answers equals um, you know uh, generate randoms n. And what you're doing here is it's going to generate n random numbers. And then you're going to pass those answers to p and those same answers to p prime. And now these two programs had better return the same answer. If they don't return the same answer, then your optimizer is wrong. Because we started with one program, and the goal of our optimizer is a compiler, right? It's a compiler, so that means that it has to take a program and produce a program with the same meaning. It just so happens here that the input language and the output language are the same. So we get it's, we don't we only have to write one interpreter. This right here is going to be the structure of all of your tests going forward. What we're going to do is we're going to extend our language, and after we extend the language, we're going to make it so that the compiler is slightly more complicated, the optimizer is slightly more complicated, and then eventually what we'll do is we'll define languages other than the R0 language that are closer to x86. And hopefully you've enjoyed this day, and that's our first class. Thanks.